Awesome. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Kate, for uh, for organizing this um, this uh, this meeting this afternoon. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sad I cannot see your faces, not just yet. But I hope we will uh, we will meet each other at some point uh, in person in in uh, in near future, near enough future. Uh, my name is Elena Riva, and I'm an associate professor and director of studies at IATO, which is the Institute for Advanced Teaching and Learning at the University of Warwick. I'm a chemical biologist as a background, and um, uh, but uh, I transitioned to become an interdisciplinarian um, during the course of, of my career. So I, I teach my modules looking at interdisciplinary issues and problems or uh, topics, and um, well-being is one of those, which obviously is at the center of, a center of research of uh, many disciplines. Um, and uh, it, it became also the interest of, of my of my research. So I'm researching in well-being and well -being teaching and learning for the past. For the past uh, I can hear it for the past five years, more or less. And uh, I'm sharing with you some some of what I've learned. But I'm really looking forward to to learning from you as well. So. I thought to start with just um, give a little refresh um, of uh, what we know uh, in regards to well-being in higher education, and um, and just taking from there and concentrate then on the teaching and learning environment. Um, so as I'm sure most of you are aware, um, at the moment in the United Kingdom, but widely internationally, um, we university are facing a crisis of students' well-being. And I've reported here some, some data that um, are quite distressing, but um, I do think they, they kind of um, give the pulse of, of, of a situation that is um, dramatically um, worsening. And I want to say here that these are data for uh, regards for students, but we also know that uh, well-being and mental health for staff working at university is is decreasing, and uh, uh, we're also uh, alarming data um, in regards to that. Um, just, just something that often some colleagues kind of get back to me is like, but you know, this issue has always been there. That is just a problem that people now feel much more free to to disclose uh, these type of issues. And um, and my my usual response is that yeah, maybe maybe that is the reason. Maybe it's just because people see it feel more free to, to, to disclose certain issues, but this doesn't mean that um, we should not focus on, on this. Um, and actually, it, it, it's a positive, the fact that more people are disclosing and more people are uh, coming forward and, and sharing um, a variety of experience around this. Um, I, there, are, there is a lot of uh, material that I put at the bottom in terms of bibliography, and at the, at the end of my, of, of my slides, you'll see three pages of bibliography. So once the slides will be shared with you, you can read all about um, what I managed to, uh, to put together um, in many years of research. So what are the causes of this declining well-being? <clears throat> Looking through literature, it, it becomes apparent that um, there are a variety of causes. Um, academic workload, um, but also high level of expectancy of academic performances, and this is through across from undergraduates up to postdoctoral researchers and, PhD, and PhD students. Financial burden, and obviously this um, is particularly true within uh, the UK uh, context in which coming to university um, costs such, um, such a significant amount of money, perhaps in comparison uh, with our European uh, states or elsewhere. And then obviously a changes in lifestyle. Um, I think we all, most of us went through uh, changes in lifestyle in our life and, and uh, we know how stressful it could be. Um, perhaps uh, uh, some of our students are changing country or are going away from their home. Um, they are entering a completely new world. Uh, that can and this obviously can cause um, anxiety and apprehension. Uh, recently, uh, in the last, I would say, um, three, four years, two, three years actually, um, there is a mounting pressure, in a sense, from the Office for Students, from the government, to really look at these issues that um, is uh, is emerging and to ensure that well-being becomes a priority for um, for the university. And obviously, well-being is something uh, extremely crucial to look at because we all have well-being. We all have a, um, 
it is something that affects all of us, the old student population, the old staff population, um, health, a, a, a well-being, um, a welfare. And uh, it is absolutely crucial and important to make sure that um, that well-being become a priority and that we can support uh, students and staff alike. So why well-being in a learning environment? Um, these data are uh, they're, they're presented in some of these courses. Um, um, you know, they, they kind of look at the all uh, university cycle, the year all university uh, life. But um, it is important really to, to, to concentrate on, uh, on the learning environment um, where often where our students ourselves spend, spend, spend a lot of time and uh, often we're involved with. So um, why should we look at the learning environment? Why? Because well-being, students' well-being is absolutely essential to learning, is integral to it. And I think the best way is Really, we learn well where we are, when we are well. We work well when, when, when we are well. Uh, and I think this is something that we can all relate to somehow. And I'm sure you can uh, go back and think um, or, or jot down some experiences uh, for yourself if, if this is true or not. But it is understood across literature that there is a, a clear link between uh, well-being and, uh, and, and learning and capacity of learning. Uh, poor students' well-being can impact uh, academic achievement, and this again uh, it goes together with the idea: be well, learn well, learn well, be well. Um, and and also a lack of resilience to protect well-being can limit a student's learning capacity and engagement, with consequences for continuation attainment. And this it's uh, it's interesting uh, on a university um, um, also in university for kind of pushing perhaps why we should care about well-being uh, even with perhaps part of the university that don't really look at well-being in the same way in which many of us I think I think do or that don't see yet the relevance of really thinking about well-being in connection to to university and learning environment. Um, also, more philosophic, more philosophically, um, higher education is about developing a all integrated person, and and really well-being is part of it. Um, and so, um, I believe personally that when when we relate with students in, in higher education. We shouldn't just concentrate on their academic achievement. On uh, they're not only academic brains; they are much more. They are the the, the old person of them is in the classroom or in the online space, um, in in the learning environment, and it's absolutely essential that that, that we that we think in this way uh, when we look at higher education and well-being. And thinking about well-being can promote this way of of looking at, at our students ourselves. So. Um, as, I, as I was saying before, uh, research indicates that well-being is associated with deep learning, and very importantly, uh, also demonstrates that teaching practices contribute to experiences of well-being. So this is, um, to me, very crucial and key, and um, and really made me think um, and study and try to understand. So what can we do from, if we know that we're being associated to learning and we know that the teaching and learning environment plays a role uh, within it, how can we support the well-being of our students and the well-being of, of ourselves in the teaching and learning environment? Um, so it's important to underline that experiences involved in the learning, so classroom culture, physical learning spaces, virtual learning spaces, the course design, the curriculum, all of the different components of the teaching and learning environment really can either have a positive or a negative impact on health and well-being. And this is, is very important because um, almost everything, everything we, we do with our students, from how we position the chairs or how we, um, we manage an, an online environment or uh, what we create in terms of, of, of inputs and materials, everything uh, can impact in a positive or negative way um, the well-being of, of the people as part of the classroom. Um, so what can we do? What, how, can we, how can we address? How can we uh, make sure that, um, that we operate and we create learning environments that are well-being conducive? Um, so there are conditions, well understood in literature, so there are conditions that can 
promote well-being in the learning environment, to sustain well-being in the learning environment. Um, and it is important, starting from, if you want, uh, also a kind of um, looking at how this, this impact can, uh, can happen. And we know uh, that the learning environment can impact on the level of stress that the students feel. Um, can impact on the degree in, to which they feel connected to others. And uh, we also understand that um, the learning environment uh, impacts on the, the extent to which students feel meaningfully engaged in the university experiences. And these are three very important kind of um, um, uh, that's the word. Uh, three very important points that really affect uh, the well-being of our students and the, uh, the overall the uh, students' experience. So, what should we foster for make sure that the learning environment um, can 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 create conditions for a better well-being, keeping in mind that impact on this at least on these three very key crucial points. Um, is recognized in literature that we should foster opportunity for social interaction sense of control over workload and if you think back at the causes that we look at the beginning opportunities to make a valued contribution um, and um, uh, an optimal level of challenge and teacher support a positive classroom culture and access to resources so all these um, these kind of, of, of conditions have been studied through literature and reported in literature to be um, fundamental and very crucial and important to create learning environments that can positively impact on the stress level, the way in which students will connect, and the, and the way in which students feel engaged. Um, so what, I, what I've done, um, together with, uh, with students and colleagues uh, at Warwick, we, tried, we wanted to, to understand if what was out there in literature was actually mapping in the Warwick environment. And also we wanted to understand better if there were some Warwick-specific issues. Um, that were affecting the well-being of our students in the learning environment. So we ran a one-year study, and uh, um, when you get the slides, you will be able to click on that, and you will be um, and you will be directed to to our report. Um, we 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 ask ourselves um, how uh, the learning and teaching environment impacts uh, on students' well-being at work. Uh, aware of what discovered in literature, but wanted to understand if there was something particular to our cohort. So some of, of the data that I report here are linked to the Warwick experience, but I believe that most of them can be um, kind of widely gene generalized. And in fact, most of our findings map, uh, map very um, sadly nicely on, on the findings in literature. So we uh, run uh, focus groups with about 150 between um, staff and students, and we involved also non-academic staff. They often get forgotten um, in, uh, in these type of studies, even though uh, they are so involved in the learning experience of our students. So we wanted to really capture the voices of, of the old Warwick community. And, and we uh, run focus groups uh, for, uh, for a few months, gathering data, um, and uh, we, we then run a thematical analysis, and I'm going to present some of our, some of our results. So, the first thing uh, that I think is very important to underline is that all the participants, um, they did identify, they did uh, expressly say that they saw a relationship for their experience between students' well-being and the teaching and learning environment. So everything I've described before, they could see for themselves. And obviously, we didn't prompt them to say them, but we just asked them to, to reflect about their experiences. Um, and, and that, for us, was a very first important thing to, to establish, uh, the fact that um, a chunk of our, of our community and uh, that um, also reflect uh, the makeup of, of the work community um, was, within, was, was able to, to, to very strongly um, identify this relationship. 
And then um, staff, and staff and students will be uh, staff and students work together uh, on uh, creating a definition of well-being, and uh, most of them identify well-being in a way that is recognized in literature. Even though um, there is not an official definition of well-being, and as I said before, it is a, is a concept that is in the in realm of many disciplines. But the majority of our students and staff saw so well-being as an holistic concept. Um, where physical, mental, social, and in some cases spiritual well-being are uh, all, all involved for uh, defining our state of being. And they identified it as, as, as feeling well and functioning well at the same time. Um, four key themes emerge from, from our analysis, and that a student-centered environment uh, has a positive impact on students' well-being, a lack of intercultural international integration has a negative impact on students' well-being, the key role of um, emotional intelligence and uh, the recognition of a close intertwined relationship between staff and students' well-being. I'll go through uh, some of, of this, um, but I invite you to think about your own practice and I invite you to think about your own experience in, this, in the student in, in the teaching learning environment. So our staff and students identified that um, an environment that makes uh, makes them uh, um, that supports their own well-being has to be personalized, flexible, open, active, and engaging. And these are all ad adjectives that have been utilized uh, many, and many times throughout the focus group. And I'll try to to to, to unpack some of these concepts with you um, in a minute. But I think it's uh, as a, as an underlying message. I think it's very important to say that students. Um, felt uh, much more valued, engaged, and noticed um, in, in an environment where, um, where they felt they could contribute, they could, uh, they could actually uh, be part of in, a, in an active way, uh, an environment that was centered around them and that uh, took in account um, everything about them, so the old person and not just the academic brain, in a sense. Um, and, and they, when such an environment that, as I said, is personalized, flexible, open, active, of course, they said that this type of environment do, does alleviate the stresses that are associated to poor well-being. So that stress, that no connection, that lack of engagement that we saw really impact on, on the well-being of our students. Therefore, are creating the student's mindful context uh, is absolutely crucial for sustaining the well-being of, of our students and I argue also of our staff. So what do the students meant for a, a personalized environment? Here I just um, just kind of gave you some some ideas of good practices or uh, that uh, we gather from our students and staff and some of them are incredibly simple and that is exactly what I love of it that very often the, the simplest Things can make the biggest uh, difference and really can help us to, um, to make people feel welcome in, in, in the learning environment. So they were saying just simply learning students' names in, in groups of you know, 20, 30 students really made them feel valued. They felt that they were there, were noticed. Um, so, so many of our students feel that once come to university, the fact that they are in a classroom or not doesn't make any difference. And that cannot, cannot surely be good for us. Um, the check-in on students before, during, and after classroom um, in order that they can access learning. Showing an interest in students' life and learning. And then seeking feedback throughout the module. So as you can see, very, very simple practices. And I'm sure you can think of way in which yourself uh, are able to create this type of environment in which you, in ways in which you can say to a person, I've noticed you, I know you're there, and I know you are important for this place and together. Flexibility, um, it, it seems to be incredibly important. We all live very complex lives, and I think this pandemic will make even more different the way in which we have to manage times. Everyone uh, is on different shadows. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Um, so I think flexibility will become even more important um, uh, in order to make sure the students feel they can manage the workload, feel they can handle what, what, uh, what they have to do. And a very negative example that really emerged throughout the focus group was in relation to assessment. 
and um, this high level of stress experience when assessment was is rigidly concentrated at few points during the academic year really made our students and actually staff who have been to, to mark and to, to assess students incredibly stressed out, also uh, giving this, this sense of inca un incapacity of manage their learning and, and in our case, our teacher teaching. Um, a positive example was provided by students and staff in relation to online learning and resources that felt could enable different ways in times of learning. Again, some other good practice um, that uh, our students and staff shared, and for example, considering the time of exams and assignments, to alleviate undue stress, and this is a call for departments really and to universities to think about this. I appreciate sometimes it's beyond the will of a single lecturer, but if we start to push our, our I am talking for work here, our departments and university to think about this issue, um, when they structure courses, when they when they think about assignments, um, this would be incredibly beneficial. Again, offering students a higher degree of choice in designing assignments. And here you can, when you click on that, you can look at uh, one assessment, the, the Iran is called Student Advisor Assessment, uh, where students can um, decide um, the topic of their assessment, which obviously has to relate it to the module and, uh, and you know, beyond, within certain parameters. And they can also decide the way in which they, um, so the medium, so some students might write an essay, some students might decide to, to, to record, to video record, some students might decide to, uh, to create a dance. And I appreciate that like that sounds crazy, but I'm really happy to talk to you more about these assessments um, if we have the opportunity to. But the point is allowing students a certain degree of choice um, that can ensure, I, I, I also argue, inclusivity. Not all students learn in the same way, not all students are able to express themselves in the same way. They might have preferred way of, of, of expressing. And I do think that um, ensuring this, this a certain level of choice um, enables um, enable students to feel more in control and enable students to feel uh, better overall when tackling assessment. Opportunity to set their own deadlines, and here I've reported an example from uh, Simon Fraser University in Canada. Provide frequent formal informal feedback, many um, other, other ideas um, below there. Um, and um, Open, uh, we said before, open, active, engaged environment. And again, I'm sure you have many, many ideas around that. But obviously, uh, creating an environment of this type can facilitate interaction. And we saw before the connect, connectedness between our students is so important. Um, and the learning environment can facilitate uh, the creation of, of a sense of community, social network with our, for our students. Um, that can really support and sustain their well-being beyond the classroom. Um, here are some, some ideas. I, I won't go through them. You, you'll have the opportunity. Um, but, um, you know, peer, for example, peer and, or group learning, um, opportunity for peer feedback, um, again, introducing a, a variety of ways in which students can, um, can, can produce material for the module uh, that welcomes a variety of ways in which they learn, um, even suggesting opportunity for students to interact outside class time. There are many, many ideas that I'm sure uh, we can bounce around and, and, and we can share that can help us to achieve an environment that is open, active and, engagement, and engaging. Um, another side that I think is very interesting and widely reported in literature is the idea of civic engagement. Um, so a, a lot of students um, feel uh, that the old person is considered and feel useful if perhaps some of, of, of the learning is connected to, to the outside world. Uh, so it doesn't remain into the university bubble. And uh, it, 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 it's reported that when a student can, um, can display civic engagement, can engage with uh, work in the community, for example, as part of the assessment, um, it really does, uh, does support um, uh, their the, the well-being and it fits, if you're familiar, uh, with the give of the five ways of well-being. But again, we can discuss a bit about this uh, later on. Um, I left this page white because ideally when you will be printing these slides or uh, looking at them uh, online, I would like you to think how can you fill it in? What are your pedagogies for creating a student-centered environment? 
So I left it white because um, because I'm sure we can we can fill it in with with so much more. So and I would like to invite you to do that uh, a, se a second later on once uh, once perhaps you revise this uh, this slide. Um, as I said before, negative impact of a lack of intercultural international integration. This is perhaps quite uh, mm, it is particularly relevant at Warwick, where we have a very diverse international community, and uh, it has been reported that um, sadly, uh, very often um, there is a lack of integration within the classroom, uh, online or or not online. Um, and uh, and uh, this lack of integration really uh, almost um, brings up complex issue of cultural misunderstanding and stigma. If you read the report that I linked before, some of the um, the the kind of comments of the students are are heartbreaking. Some some students that really feel completely isolated because they come from from another. Uh, perhaps from a different background, they don't feel they can integrate. On the other side, students from a diverse cultural background, they might see that perhaps the lack of um, English proficiency of some of, of their of their peers might uh, might be an obstacle for for their assessment and therefore they want to integrate. There are a variety of issues that really emerge, but all of them remind to uh, point towards the idea that it really lacks this integration in the classroom. And actually, it was very interesting because the majority of students and staff were saying that actually the learning environment should be and would be uh, the most important place where this integration can start to happen. Here again, example of, of good practices um, that some of our staff and students highlighted, like international intercultural training, norm for respectful uh, classroom discussion, inclusive curriculum. Um, fostering a responsible learning community. So perhaps the idea that uh, all the classroom contributes to the creation of a glossary or um, thoughtful group formation. There are a variety of ideas that and practices that can embed it in the classroom so that we can remove some of the obstacles that, uh, that at the moment are, uh, are present. Um, again, a blank one for you later on to fill it in. Um, and then the positive impact of emotional intelligence, and I think this is a kind of no-brainer for uh, for all the teachers and all the people that are involved in teaching the learning environment. Um, you know, is, is the relevance of the role of human. Uh, I think we've lost Eleanor. Yes, I was wondering if it was just me. Yep, we've lost her briefly. She'll be back in a moment, I'm sure. Oh, here she comes. We lost you for a moment then, Elena. You're back. Excuse me. But you're on mute, I think. Okay. Uh, sorry, apologies for that. And uh, and that is true, I was saying, uh, for all the, the relationships, student staff, student, student staff, staff. Um, and, uh, all the relationships within the teaching and learning environment are absolutely fundamental. And um, the relevance of, of human qualities and behaviors within the teaching and learning environment uh, plays a massive role in sustaining well-being. Staff members really articulated the core need to possess emotional intelligence in their interaction with students. So directing care by employing what they call the soft skill, but they're not soft, the most important one in my opinion, such as approachability, empathy, showing a, capac a capacity for listening, communicating effectively. And actually, these are all qualities that are often as associated to good teaching practices. They're not, um, sometimes you hear the idea, well, only some people have this quality. Well. Actually, no. <laughs> uh, this is, is this, this quality can be fostered. We can we can look at them and we can find ways. And I'm sure Theo and Kate might might talk about this for really um, embedding certain practices within our teaching and learning environment. And again, some example of of good practices: um, sharing teaching philosophy, introducing yourself to your class, and not only uh, your academic brain but your all your all person. Um, letting students know that you care about about them, their success, their their learning in the modules, 
there are uh, many ways in which I'm sure we are able to display um, our, uh, our, uh, our compassion and our, the fact that we care. We care about our students and, and we care about our colleagues. Um, again, blank page, I'm sure you'll fit it in. And uh, the last thing, which I think is incredibly important, is the fact that our staff and students serve a, almost a loop, a relationship between the staff and student well-being. Uh, loads of our staff disclosed that they, um, they, they felt that um, very often their precarious well-being restrict their ability to create the environment that we were talking before. To, to make sure that create an environment that is stimulating, active, engaging, say, that foster disconnectedness. And this is because themselves are a struggle to, um, to, to really support their own well-being. Often this is due to um, a lot of um, stresses and the stresses they are imposed and recognized within the education, uh, educational sector. So um, a lot of our uh, staff disclose how an increasing pressure to perform excessive workload, precarious contract, a culture of workplace surveillance, a lack of well-being support really impacted on their well-being. And as a consequence, they were not able to, to work with the students for producing that environment that displays the characteristic that we revealed before. Almost in a sense, I'm not object of care, I'm not object of compassion. I've really struggled to get through. It's very difficult for me to create an environment that, that supports well-being. And in this sense, there is a clear loop. And I believe that if we want to make a change, um, and if we want to truly support our students' well-being, we have to think about our staff well-being as well. Um, and here again, um, my call is for compassion. And uh, I do believe that exactly what we were saying before, um, the teaching and learning environment, but not only, um, should be um, embedded in the recognition of the old person, the old staff person, the old student person. And uh, if we want to create an environment that's supportive of well-being, it has to, it has to display those, um, those behavioral characteristics that we were talking before. About. And it's very interesting, I think, the work of Lilius that looks at embedding compassion in organizations. And even if it's simply odd with our current organizations that you know um, are based on marketization and commercialization of education, still I do think that working at the work, uh, looking at the work of Lilius, it gives a lot of hints on how compassion can be, we can try to embed in, in the very fabric of our organization so that we can support effectively staff and students' well-being. So this is just a, a hint of what we're doing at the moment at Warwick. Uh, out of this, um, and it's my last two slides, so I shut up very soon. Um, some of uh, one ways in which we thought to to start to foster um, a, a community and create connect connectedness among the staff and students was to create a a Warwick Wellbeing Pedagogy uh, Library. So a collection of ideas, practices, pedagogies, the staff and students um, practice in their own classroom. And that can be divided in the four categories that I've shown before. So student-centered environment, um, um, creating an interaction between uh, staff and um, um, supporting the interaction between international students, um, emotional intelligence and staff and students will be in group. So I don't know if this works. Um, I don't know if I can uh, get out of here, but um, I don't know if you can see this or not. Possibly not. Gosh, I've lost completely. Can you see this? Can anybody know? No, we're still on slides. Um, Christina, do you know if it's possible to click and open a website? Um, we can share the link, but when I've clicked on it, it does look like there's a sign-in page, so we can't see it. Um, uh, because it's been closed. What we Never mind. Can share um, the desktop if you'd like to do that instead. I will, yeah, I can do that. How can I share okay. my desktop? Sorry. Um, so let's have a look. Um, we go. Share. Yeah, so if you, you can click there, share my screen. Yeah. Oops. Mm. Mm. There we go. It may take a while for us. 
Dana, I hope this works. <laughs> I forgot to. I might have to just bring it up again. Thank you. I, otherwise, I'll, I'll just keep talking until there's like a on. I know what I have to say. So, um, yes, so we collected 100, uh, 100 uh, pedagogies more or less from certain students. We divided them in, in the four categories. And uh, oh, stu our students did this. So we had students officers that, that worked tirelessly tire for interviewing um, many colleagues and students. And we managed to create, um, uh, to create this, uh, this big library so that uh, staff that wish to, to embed or try to think about how to create and sustain well-being uh, within the classroom, they can, they can look and be inspired by the work of our staff and students. Um, and uh, they can also be able to filter them according to class size, the type of, the type of, of faculty they belong to. So we aim to really support our staff to try to think how to, to embed uh, well-being while connecting to each other and while making the most of each other knowledge and, uh, and understanding of students and self-understanding. The last, the other thing that, the, the last thing that I want to talk about is the fact that we realize the relevance and the importance of well-being literacy um, across, across students and staff. Um, so I created a module which is called Understanding Wellbeing Theory and Practice that is open to students across faculty, so regardless of the department, students can take the module. Um, and they, they look at the concept of well-being, understanding uh, what well-being is and uh, from an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary perspective. So they look at um, uh, from a scientific perspective, from an economic perspective, social sciences, they really learn and try to understand what well-being is and they look at the practices of well-being as well. So they look at mindfulness, for example, they look at physical, um, um, physical activities and so on and so forth. Given the, su the success of the module, uh, Warwick has decided to, um, that they want to open it up to all students. So obviously teaching thousands of students would be complicated. And therefore we are working on, on the development of a Warwick open online course that will be called Understanding Wellbeing, that will be uh, open uh, to all students uh, of Warwick next academic year. And this is really for um, for uh, putting really well-being on the agenda and for uh, making sure that well-being literacy um, and understanding of well-being can, can increase across across campus and believing that as we can see for health um, the, the relevance of literacy is very important for for increasing um, health and well-being and this is really that's it for me and uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, the usual slides with uh, with all the thanks, the thanks to Office for Students, Research England and WAHIA, which is the Warwick uh, International Higher Education Academy, they supported my research and really supported the, and support uh, constantly the work I'm doing. Uh, I apologize for for the for trying to <laughs> messing up the all the all the presentation, opening up links. Sorry, Christina, for that. Uh, but I'm really happy to 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 share um, all the links uh, at second stage. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elena. That was amazing. What a wonderful presentation. Okay, everybody, we have about five minutes for questions and answers. I can see multiple attendees are, are typing in the box. Oh, that is a good sign. It is a good sign. So, if anybody's got any questions, do feel free to pop them in the box, uh, in the chat box. Um, if the, the the system we are planning to follow is, if they're relatively straightforward to answer, Elena will just answer them. Um, and if she, if they, if they need expansion, um, she'll ask you to stick the microphone on and talk about them a little bit more, if that's okay. But that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your thanks. I really appreciate it. I was super nervous and I feel better now. <laughs> you don't need to be nervous. That was wonderful. Okay, so lots of people saying thank you. Has anybody got any questions? Oh, I think there was one. Split class from Kathy. Kathy Lovell says, Elena, any further insights into the virtual learning environment, bearing in mind the impact of COVID, and we at the OU depend on this anyway? Yeah, well, I'm sure Kate will will talk more about that later on. But um, I think that a lot of the variables that I've described um, for for um, for the in classroom environment they are really relevant also for the online environment. In fact, very often students were 
um, so the idea of creating a student-centered online environment where students can um, truly participate and engage, um, it was deemed as absolutely fundamental. Um, there, there are many overlaps. Of course, there will be a certain kind of um, characteristics that will uh, depend on the environment. Like, for example, we know that the physical learning environment is fundamental, the way in which we position chairs and uh, the way in which we position ourselves as teacher within the classroom in itself send a message. I do believe that there is a correspondent idea within the online learning environment. The idea, the way in which we host the type of platform and if we do synchronous or asynchronous. And there is almost, I, I would say that the general uh, categories, so student-centered, emotional intelligence, uh, connection, uh, they cut across both the, both the environments. I don't see a difference in there, but I do appreciate that there are particular kind of ways in which the answer to this issue can be declined accordingly to, to, the, to the environment. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Kate will say, will say more about that. I know that she will, but I hope it's helpful. I hope it gives you an idea. And um, one thing for sure is that the online environment has been described as, as a, as a um, this research was conduced before COVID, obviously, as we can as we can tell. But uh, students were saying how the online opened up uh, opportunities for studying at different times and for interacting with uh, students to, with material at different times. And they really appreciate the flexibility that is linked to it. Um, even though some of the students uh, were uh, were concerned about um, the fact that they, in the online environment we we can be even more faithless than what we are sometimes in the physical learning environment. And this idea of making appearing faces to me is very important. So how, what is the equivalent of learning names in a virtual learning environment? What is the name of making, making sure that students have a face in, in the learning environment in the way in which they want? It's, um, yeah. Um, I read, um, so Sebastian, how much of this agenda can should the university act, uh, achieve on their own? Do we have the resources? Um, so, so uh, for example, Warwick University, and um, I take the opportunity, has just released a well-being um, strategy for 2020-2024. Um, and there is the idea that, um, and, and if you Google it, it will come up. Um, and there is the idea that, um, obviously, well-being uh, is holistic and needs to be achieved uh, in an holistic manner with all the different parts of the university joining together. So there is the idea of embedding well-being in the curriculum um, and um, also reinforcing uh, alongside the counselling services and, and all these activities that can support well-being. Um, so I do believe that the university have the duty, really, as part of the duty of care, to, to think about ways and put resources uh, for supporting well-being um, across, so in a teaching and learning environment and obviously beyond. Um, and uh, in our case, we have involved the NHS, uh, in particular in um, if we think about the counselling services and the well-being services, we have strengthened the links with the GPs and, uh, and we're trying to look at ways in which we can make sure that uh, well-being is all, supported all around. Um, you can have a look at our strategy. I know that um, many universities have developed or developing well-being strategy in that sense. Um, and so could you articulate a little more on the interdisciplinary perspective on well-being? And um, yes, so um, as I said, I think well-being is at the center of, of understanding and the search of, of many disciplines from philosophy, if you think Aristotelian, and from you know ancient philosophy to modern philosophy, and it's well understood that our well-being depends on a combination of variables. It's not. Um, it, it depends. Uh, there are uh, some uh, kind of neuro, neuro, neuroscience underpinning and, and biology underpins how we feel in our well-being. Um, there are social, uh, obviously, um, factors that can impact on it. Uh, the classical question, does money make you happy, uh, probably um, kind of underpins the idea of what economy, economics um, has to do with, with well-being. Um, we, we look, really, well-being is, is studied from a variety of perspectives. So many disciplines look at well-being and try to understand how the part of the discipline has something to tell us um, about well-being. 
Um, and my argument is that for having a, a clear understanding of well-being, um, we need to look at all the different ways in which we think about well-being from different disciplinary perspectives in order to inform each other and to, to understand more about it. If you want, perhaps public health tries to do that. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a medical subject, but I think more, a lot of work is going towards an holistic understanding of well-being that encompasses um, the different understanding of different disciplines. Um, I'm really, you, you perhaps have a look, um, I'll, I'll share uh, the link to my module that probably uh, can explain better than me now what, what I mean with it. Um, I hope I hope uh, I was, um, was clear enough. So I missed one thing. Are you talking about command? Yeah. Uh, when any group of students more difficult to recruit find? Um, so in our case, I have to say that in terms of uh, ethnicity and uh, age, um, we were, and this is true, I do a lot of research with PhD students as well, we are on, on track with the makeup of Warwick. So uh, we see the same uh, kind of percentage um, attending to our group compared to the, to the big population. What we see is definitely many more females um, wanting to engage with the research and uh, with, uh, with our studies. And this is true across really research on well-being across literature. And uh, this is um, something that uh, we are very aware of. And um, for example, also my module, um, 80% of, of the students that sign up are female. Um, while we don't see, um, and same goes with research and so on. Uh, this is true across literature. We have a real problem in engage uh, male students um, in, in, in this type of work. And for example, as part of our strategy, we are really looking at ways in which we can make sure that the male voice is heard. Um, and we make sure that we can reach uh, our male students more effectively. Um, that's perfect. Thank you ever so much, Elena. That's, that's brilliant that we've had so many questions. I'm actually going to move us on now. So if anybody else has any other questions, keep a hold of them, because I'm hoping that we're going to have some time for general discussion at the end. But in the meantime, I just want to say thank you again to Elena. That was a really inspiring presentation. So we're thank on. You. Thank you. I've stopped sharing my work up so I can. That's perfect, thank you. Okay, so we will now pass over to our second speaker today, uh, Theo Gilbert. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, I, I, I wonder if everybody can hear me, can you? Perfectly. Can anyone hear yep, me? Lots of people saying yes in the comments. Box. Perfect, excellent, excellent. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, I will probably be confirming and underlining and, uh, and resonating a lot of what Eleanor has said, and no doubt Kate too. So I can see how integrated I think these talks are. Well planned, Kate. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the micro skills of compassion and group work. I'm from the University of Hertfordshire. I'm part of the Learning and Teaching Innovation Centre, which has been very instrumental in getting the teaching, learning and assessment of compassion onto our five-year university strategic plan to be rolled out across the university. Latest um, uh, colleague to take this up, a professor of physics. Um, I hope that you will see that this is these micro skills of compassion I want to talk to you about are, are very, very easy to teach and put into practice with any discipline, any discipline at all. So let's make a start. <clears throat> um, here we are. First of all, I think we should just have a very quick look at what I intend to, to, to take us through. Just very quickly, we're going to try and understand what compassion is. And right now, let's have a big call out to the Compassionate Mind Foundation, which has done so much of the robust theoretical bedrock work that has to be done before any university can say, we are going to put compassion, teaching it, cultivating it, assessing it, that means rewarding it, on the modern university degree. Thank you, thank you to the Compassionate Mind Foundation. Declaration of Interest, my, my brother started that. He was a, uh, Paul Gilbert, he is a professor of clinical psychology, OBE, for this particular work. But he's working in compassion-focused therapy. How can we use that theory to bring that in to make a difference to student well-being in universities? So we're going to see a, a bit about what the Compassion Foundation has found. It is generating work in neuroscience, clinical psychology, 
um, uh, group psychotherapy and pulling that together where it's happening around the world as well. There are other great centers working on this. We're going to look at Compassion's Saboteur, and that has very much to do with the very neoliberalism that drives higher education. We'll have a look then at group work. Group work is the crucible where we can start to talk about, really start to get in deep and dismantle these issues that cause students difficulties with their mental well-being, their general well-being, their functional well-being too, that Anna was talking about. And then we're going to have a look at the techniques, the techniques, the very easy techniques that can dismantle these difficulties and actually develop students' abilities to connect to each other socially and think more clearly, more critically, more analytically, with evidence from three statisticians now in three universities that that is happening, with some surprising results from the BAME gap. So just moving on quickly. Um, okay, so I'd like to explain that it is suggested that um, compassion is not exactly an emotion. One of the reasons why people say compassion on the curricula, I don't think so. It's out of my remit. It's out of my expertise. We're not here to, uh, to patronize students in this way. And in any case, compassion is an emotion. Let's be careful about that. It may not be an emotion. Although we know that very often compassion, um, compassion may um, uh, be forefronted by an emotion. Rage, for example, rage that has led to the compassion, which is quite calm in saying we are going to have peaceful protests over what we have seen of the death of George Floyd. Or joy, love. Any number of emotions can instigate the psychobiological motivation. That is what compassion is. It is a psychobiological motivation to notice for noticing distress or disadvantaging of yourself or others and doing something about it that is smart and wise. This is the current definition of compassion. It actually comes from a sensitivity to compassion and a commitment to do something to reduce that. But what does that mean in pedagogical terms that our students can really understand? Here it is, in group work, this is what we're going to do. We're going to notice distress or disadvantage of yourself or others and do something about it, right there in the classroom, and I'll explain why. Um, there are three types of compassion that uh, the Compassionate Mind Foundation reminds us of. The first one is self-compassion. We meet a problem already. I was speaking to um, I was speaking to um, a friend in a education department in a university recently who said self-esteem is what we talk about to students only self-esteem well that means of course that their students will then take that into the classroom and teach the value of self-esteem to children and why not however self-esteem and there's a lot of literature on this um, Emma Kingston for example um, Kristen Neff, 1.5 million views on a TED talk. She's an educational psychologist on the difficulties of self-esteem compared to self-compassion. Self-esteem depends on measuring yourself against, against everybody else in some kind of performance. Who has the most followers? Am I the best looking? Am I the fastest on the track? Have I got the best grades? It is unsustainable. It is toxic. It's a crash and burn thing to be clinging to. Instead, self-compassion, which allows us to actually view, to get above and actually witness the sometimes very critical self-bullying thoughts we have, separate from them and just look at them and deal with them from that, not identify them as self-esteem encourages us to. Uh, so the first aspect of compassion is self-compassion. A lot to learn about that. Look at Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F -F, on TED Talks. Brilliant. And the Compassionate Mind Foundation has a tremendous amount to say about that too. The Compassionate Mind Foundation also reminds us the second, the second type of compassion is, this is very important for our students, because when self-compassion is gone, got to have self-esteem, got to have self-esteem, when self-compassion is just not taught, not understood, and not put into practice, the second type of compassion closes down very quickly, and that can be dangerous for well-being for us and for students. That is the ability to be sensitive to the compassion that is shown to us. So even if I, um, so even if I, even if I say to a child once, 
that was so frightened of going to school, just count the smiles. He would burst into tears and say, you have no idea what I'm going through. Um, sensitivity to the compassion acknowledging, noticing compassion to yourself from others when your self-compassion is gone, very difficult. It's the first thing that shuts down. The third type of compassion is compassion for others. So, so let's have a look at what we're trying to teach students to practice in their group work. And we've got to do this in very, very practical ways. Noticing distress or disadvantage of oneself, that's very, very difficult because in higher education, students are encouraged to normalize, normalize, normalize. Got to be resilient, got to toughen up. They've got to toughen up. I can't help them because that could bring my marks down comparatively. This is a nutty way to continue with, uh, with education as um, Ken Robinson, the much lamented deceased now, Ken Robinson pointed out. So what have we got here? We've got uh, a highly competitive individualistic society, overlapping cultures of competitive individualism um, that is encouraged and exacerbated by higher education and in education. And students come to us with a threat system at the back of their brain, which is so overstimulated that this competitive individualism seems to take foreground an awful lot. Let's have a look at that a little further. Um, if we go back as far as 2009, could you just have a look at this? A survey of 938 black students revealed that 23% of them described their academic, their, academic their, their university experience as cakey. 70% isolating, hostile. They talked of alienation and exclusion. And this is why we say the crucible is in the group work. That's where people meet online or indeed in classrooms. This is what the, the, the NUS um, concluded, that all these problems spawned from inside the classroom, feeling left out of discussion and debates. So many tutors will say, oh, it's up to me. It's up to me to take better care of my students, to learn all their names. To, and, and it's true, it's true, we're all trying to do this. But another consideration is that perhaps we could assess students on their ability to develop their own innate skills of taking care of each other to the degree that they're thinking if one of us goes down, we all go down. Now we're starting to get some healthy thinking and we go into the classroom, we sort it out there, whether that's on online or, or in physical classrooms. Something that works well in the physical classroom, if you ever get back there, is, um, is a, a speed meet. Think about speed dating. Imagine two rows of students facing each other in the middle of your classroom. If you have cliques there, you might want the cliques to stand in one line alone. There's a, there's a reason for that. So you have a line of students facing a line of students, just like in speed dating, and you ask them to close their eyes. Professor Marily, uh, 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 Ludwig Bressier in uh, San Diego University has now managed to get compassionate and mindful training onto a, uh, a module there for all students, for all her students. So thinking about this, breathing in deep, when you wake up really anxious in the morning, breathe in deep on four and hold your breath, hold your breath for seven seconds. You can teach students how to do this in the classroom and then let it out gradually. Why not get your speed meeting group waiting to be given instructions what they're going to do next as they stand in the classroom um, to just try this deep breathing because it swaps, it tricks the brain into thinking when it's in a sympathetic system, which is ah, ah, activity, activity, got to look, look out for threats, for, for risk, for being, making a fool of myself. It slows that down. It tricks the brain into thinking there is no problem here and swapping over to the parasympathetic system. That immediately decreases the amount of adrenaline and cortisol, the stress hormone that is flooding the brain. So these, this deep breathing, which Mariana, which, um, which Mary Lee gets students to do every time they come into a classroom, she says, you don't know what kind of traumas they've come from or experienced at home or on the way. Um, and then ask them to close their eyes, just close their eyes and tell them the truth that the universe has been trying to get them into the world for thousands of years, one tiny mistake one tiny mistake and it would all have gone to ruin. And the person that that student is right now wouldn't be here. That student is a miracle. Every single one of them is a unique miracle. There has never been a person like this before in the universe and this person will never come again. And as Wordsworth says, it is not, it is not the major achievement that marks the value of a human life, but the countless human kindnesses, all of those lost if there had been one tiny genetic change out of the millions possible, if the great-great-grandfather hadn't met the great-great-grandmother under that 
that, that apple tree 5,000 years ago. It's absolutely amazing. And then you simply ask them to open their eyes and look into the eyes of the miracle opposite them. And then any questions you may, may we need to or wish to ask them about your module or about themselves, they are so ready for this. Math students have been hugging each other. This is just pre-COVID when they were, when I was asked by a professor of physics to come and see if we could make relationships a little bit better between these math students. You walk into a room, you know what it's like, colleagues. You see the loners sitting by themselves, the black students sitting by the, together for safety, the international students sitting together for safety, the white students, what is going on here? We're missing our chances to interculturalize. So let's just get, get back into the classroom and see what we can do. We need to, because as Eleanor turned, has told us, uh, student levels of suicide and depression are now out of control. Uh, the Guardian tells us that one, one student, one university student commits suicide in this country every four months, no weeks, no days, yes. We can't go on like this. And it's all over the world, it's not just here. Here are photos from another demonstration in India about the high suicide rates of lower caste students for the ways they are treated when they are finally allowed into university and get an awful shock about how welcome they are. Uh, so let's do, how, where did, where do we, how do we get into this state? Well, as the Compassionate Mind Foundation points out, we, we really need a bit of theory for us to take, take our new weapons into the classroom to fight for compassion there with our students. Uh, here's, here's the human brain. And if you can see here this leafy bit, that's the reptilian brain. That's the first bit of brain we started off with through our evolutionary history. And right in that part of the brain is the very powerful threat system. It means if I was walking along as a Stone Age man and I noticed something walk in the grass, as my lovely friend Karen Clark points out, I would be on it. I would notice that. I would not fail to notice that. My brain would be overwhelmed by the need to pay attention to that only. Now, there's a little problem. There's a little problem with that because this is still a very, very powerful thing, the threat system. You never escape it. You're dreaming about threat and running away from things or worrying about things or having nightmares. You're waking up at five o'clock in the morning, perhaps worrying about the workload, what you're going to do, how you're going to cope, our students too. Everyone is doing this. The threat system is stimulated by so many overlapping cultures and society. We've got a real problem for our students. By the time they arrive with us, their threat system is ruined. It's raw. And then on top of that, later on, we'll come back to the why this is such a big problem, because this threat system interacts with other parts of the brain it was never meant to. Um, as my brother Paul Gilbert points out, the human brain is a very tricky, tricky piece of engineering to deal with. Mother Nature has tried her best. Later on, we developed the mammalian brain. Wonderful. And that gave us real strong attachment to our children, our babies. So we have this powerful uh, ability to, 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 to care. That's also innate. It can't be, we can't be removed from us. And then we have the beautiful neocortex, which developed in the human brain, allowing us to imagine and create and reason. We have law, philosophy, art, fantastic. But what happens when the threat system says, move aside, I'm going to press gang the neocortex into my, into my service. And this happens all the time. Think about it this way. You go into a shop, and you meet a, uh, lots and lots and lots of really nice shop assistants, and then one is mean to you, really mean, or even worse, mean to the loved one with you. And you're going home and you're thinking, who can I write to? What should I have said? What should somebody else have said? Uh, it's three o'clock in the morning and you're deciding what you're going to compose in your letter to the company. Goodness me, can you imagine? And what's happened is that the threat system here has, lo has press gang, has locked into this, locked us into a ruminating loop. This is very dangerous for our species because it means that the threat system can be manipulated in all of us by politicians who persuade us. Maybe you can think of some. The people we've regarded as our friends, our fellow citizens, our neighbors are actually our enemy. Hitler was very good at this. Um, there's, a, there's a wall being built in America, I believe, by somebody who's pretty good at this. Um, we're leaving Europe. Uh, I wonder if that had something to do with it. But the thing is, the thing is, what that leads to is division and separation, and we mirror it. We mirror it, this hierarchy, this hierarchy, where people have to try and be different from each other in higher education. So what are we going to do about this? What can we do in the classroom about all this? At least we know how the brain works and what we're up against. All right. So let's go back again, noticing not normalizing. 
Not normalizing distrust or disadvantage of yourself or others is the key. In other words, being able to show students how to look very even for, at forensic detail about what is going on in the group. And they are very, very, very good at this, but it's not rewarded or cultivated in education. It's not one of the things we teach. And that's why things can go horribly pear-shaped for everybody's well-being. And when we say something smart, as my brother Paul points out, compassion is a cognitive skill. That's why it belongs. It belongs on every university curriculum, in, in, I would suggest. It is no good, he says, diving in to save somebody from drowning. If when you hit the water, you remember you can't drown, you can't swim. So, of course, we've got to be thinking smart all the time, really smart. Compassion means thinking very smartly about how you're going to reduce suffering now, as soon as possible. Let's have a look at this. Here's, here's a lovely, lovely, um, a really, really good example of compassion at its most cognitively, most cognitively sharp. Compassion is sharp cognitive skills. So here is Andrew Hutchinson seeing that this, um, this demonstrator here, anti, um, uh, he was an anti-protester. He'd come with friends, his team, how interesting, who had abandoned him. Uh, he's seen in a picture raising his hands to the, to the crowd uh, and he's pulled into the crowd and he's going to be, he's going to get a really bad beating. And this chap here just says to himself, he was interviewed afterwards, I could not see another human being go down like that. I couldn't. He went in and picked him up. But look, guys, this guy, he says that he saw, he felt the blows of other people raining down through this man's body into his own. So I'm looking at this and what do we see? His team, these are, these are his friends. Uh, they have um, a professional background, I think, as uh, bouncers. They meet in the gym. They just knew what to do. Look very carefully, forensic, careful, careful watching of the group. Our students learn to do this so quickly and so, so well. Can you see? This friend here is, is protecting the carrier. He is protecting his head, actually holding his head. He's holding his head too as though he has been hit there. We don't know what's going on with this person, but we, we see this guy is looking for the way forward for Andrew to take. This guy is looking to the left. This guy is looking behind. What's going on behind? This is absolute perfect teamwork, isn't it? How did they know what to do? How did they know what to do? And how can we bring that innate compassion, smart compassion into the classroom? So I'd like to talk to you now about, I wonder if you could put up your hands if we talk about the group now, group work in the classroom, because it's all there. We've got it in our brains. We just get to get the threat system under control in spite of what higher education and many other cultures tell us to do. Can you put up your hands, please, if you have ever been in group work or staff rooms or witnessed it with students in seminars and discussion groups where one person has taken over the meeting and done lots and lots of talking? Could you put up your hands if you have ever witnessed that? It may be in the staff room. I've been asked to work with staff as well, in business as well, and in the public sector. Well, 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 that's quite a few. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What are we going to do about that? Uh, could you now, can I ask you another question? What would you, have you ever been in a group, in the staff room or in the classroom, where you have seen somebody not contributing, not speaking in that meeting? You may have been one of those. You may have been a monopolizer like me or a quiet one like me. In different situations, we are, all, aha, okay, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? How much time do I have left, Kate? I'm so sorry, I haven't you're been taking, you're, paying attention you're enough You're fine, the Theo, don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Um, another 10, 15 minutes, if you like. Lovely, lovely, lovely. So this is what we find. This is what we find. Group work online in the classroom. This is what we find that the two biggest problems, the two most problematic and common student reported behaviors and now staff reported behaviors in staff rooms too, are non-contributors non and monopolizers. So this is what we're gonna do, guys. We're gonna think, right, we know about how the brain has been put together. Mother nature doing the best thing it can. 
the best you can, but making, but allowing the threat system, the prehistoric reptilian brain threat system to overrule everything, even in spite of our advanced, beautiful neocortex that no other species has in, this, in the form that we have it. What are we going to do? We know that non-contributing comes from the threat system. Threat system, think about it. Flight, freeze. There we go. We've got our non-contributor there. Flight or freeze or monopolize. And now monopolize is very interesting. The people that self-nominated uh, leaders who take over and speak a lot, highly engaged, very enthusiastic, um, don't even notice that other people in the group. If they disappeared off the face of the earth, would they actually notice? And you will notice in, but here's, well, here's the important thing. Yalom says, the great psychotherapist, group psychotherapist, Yalom says, you, you monopolize is often the most anxious person in the group. The monopolizer is often the most anxious person in the group. And Duhigg, if you look at Duhigg, who uh, looked at a study that cost $5 million that, do, that Google um, uh, undertook to find the best of their teams, the how did the best teams work? They found that the teams with cherry-picked people, experts, were monopolizing so much they actually hobbled their team's intelligence. Quote, hobbled the team's intelligence. That's a nice way to put it. But Yalom says, Yalom says, you do not want to silence the monopolizer. You do not want to silence the monopolizer. I love Yalom because he understands what Paul keeps pointing out, what the compassionate mind keeps pointing out. The consequences of the design of our brain is nobody's fault. Nobody is to blame. No student, nobody is to blame when they behave like this. In the staff room as well. But we are all responsible for getting it sorted out. Uh, the non-contributors as well can sometimes, when you interview them after a, a group discussion, which they've said very little, they may say, and these may be students who are getting the best marks in their essays, so their groups really needed to hear their voice, maybe saying things like, um, big mouths and loud mouths, I write down what I want to say, I can't get in, I can't get in, uh, even down to selective mutism in, the other, in, in, in time, as, as a university that I worked with had discovered with high achieving students who were too frightened to speak and had medical evidence for that. So these are the two problems we're going to try and look at. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking we could just talk about this for the moment, all right? Um, first of all, just a few tips. You could encourage students to be very careful with the language they use. Serendipity and dichotomy and stuff are all great words, but the thing is that Maybe working class students won't understand those words. International students. Can we please speak for international audiences? Plain, straightforward English so that everybody can understand. Not slang, not colloquialisms. Silences. The group is just breathing and thinking. So anxious, monopolizing students who will say, I can jump into any silence, even if I haven't read the text. No wonder the students who have prepared and acquired to can't get in. So to allow reasonable silences, as Yvonne Turner talks about too, describing the pathologizing of silences by some students, so that the quieter students, local and international, have no chance to get in. Not normalizing seeing others talked over. If you see somebody talked over in a group, bring that person back. Keisha, that was an interesting point you were making there. Could you just tell us more about that? There are loads of things that students can do to rescue the student that's been shoved out. And the, by the monopolizer, we don't blame the monopolizer. The monopolizer may be the most anxious person in the group, but there's a lot we can do. Keisha, um, can we go back to what you were saying? Or well, John, that was really interesting. But uh, Keisha, I just didn't quite catch what you were saying about there's lots of things students can do this beautifully. I was giving them ideas, stupid ideas. The students' emergent pedagogy, which I've been recording with an anthropology um, background, has made this a student emergent pedagogy. Their compassion and kindness and resourcefulness of putting these things right, once they're finally given permission by the, by the institution, is absolutely a marvel to behold. Disrupting cliques and dominating pairs. So a monopolizer, if you're in a classroom, will often look at one person only, the person opposite them. That person is now a colluder, a partner in crime. What can they do? If you're in the classroom, what's worked very powerfully is for the person who's colluding, who's been trapped in the eye gaze of the, um, of the monopolizer, just direct the monopolizer's attention to, to the person on the left, to the person on the right. This may be opposite for you. Hey, there's, there are two other people here. It turns out four 
Lots of reasons for that. It's a wonderful, wonderful way. That it's a really good, good um, uh, teamwork group. You cannot do that when you're teaching, but students can. Here's something that works really, really well. Students can each bring an article. For school, it could be from the Guardian, from the New, um, new Scientist. It could be for, for those, you know, it could be from the New Scientist for, for engineering students, for example, to start off with. But each one brings an article and they'll be put into a group of four. After the speed meeting, they'll be quite ha comfortable. They'll be more comfortable with getting into groups of four of people they don't know, don't know every week until they do know everybody. Um, so they present their article. The student one presents his or her article and then says to the others, it, it will be a something with a, with a source. This is an article I have found by um, uh, Professor Brown from, um, in the International Journal of Business dated, whatever it is, this is what is it, the main points, don't have to read the whole thing like a machine, but the main points and some notes and explain what that is and critical thinking. What kind of question would they ask the author if the author was with them drinking tea and coffee and eating cakes in their little group? This critical thinking, this analytical thinking to get going like this and, and put these questions as well to the, to the rest of the group. Uh, so it's so, uh, uh, present it, to present the um, to present the article and then say, what do you think, guys? Not any questions, not any questions, because then it becomes a panel interview. But what do you think about this article? Nobody is the leader. Everybody is discussing equally. And then when that's fading, the presenter to say, Keisha, could I ask you to, to, to uh, present your article now, please? So what we're doing here is we're asking the monopolizers to be concise, be concise. So monopolizers are told, well, you're going to be assessed on this. Oh, but if these people don't want to talk and I want to talk, you're going to be, so we've got to be, be courageous and, and uh, courageous and firm about the role of compassion. What then we find is that these students are holding back, holding back. And when they do say something, they come forward and the tutor will say in our interviews, when that student comes forward, they, they don't, when they finally speak, you can tell they've been listening and they pull the group up, they really pull the group up and they learn much more. That's not enough. We need to bring back these reluctant monopolizers and ask, how did you get on with that? And we hear things like, I'm listening now and I'm noticing forensically. Remember, we did that little bit of forensic look at that photograph. I'm really noticing what's going on in the group. Great. That's what compassion demands. Notice the familiar becomes strange. I don't rush in now like I used to. I let others say that. And then when I've got really something to say, then I say it. And I'm learning a lot more. Of course, as Yolan points out, how can the monopolizer learn anything from just hearing of themselves speak all the time? That is a group working on one engine instead of four. Uh, and the, our over monopolizing students will say, once they've pulled back from that, they say, I even notice now, for example, that a shy student speaks and they make a really good point. And then another student speaks on top of that. And you can see the second student hasn't listened to a thing. That, that shy student has said. Now our monopolizer is noticing things they never, they never um, noticed before and is ready to bring that shy student back in. Students start to learn these connections with each other so quickly and are asking us again and again, why weren't we taught this in school? What, I, want to I want to show you a few more things if I may. Um, let's just go forward quickly, quickly, quickly. What have we found? This is how we can, this is how we can, um, assess this. Here's some assessment practice. Remember, we are setting out to assess this in many, many schools in the University of Hertfordshire. We have to do this. And one of the reasons is why. Why here? Here's the critical thinking scores for local black students in a group of 38, ethnic minority students, international students and local white students. So Professor uh, Dr. Matteo Crotter, a reader in statistics at the Royal Veterinary College says the critical thinking scores here show no BME gap at all. Here, different story. This is critical thinking in the essay. This was, these were seminar, a final seminar that was recorded and they can be recorded online. These little group discussions can be recorded online, uploaded, and you can assess them. You can pop in for regular ones, actually, just to have a look 10 minutes in every group. Students get very excited because they are owning this is self organized learning environments. So some of these students were saying we could have gone on for more than an hour. 
in the classroom, it was a pity that we had to leave. We had to leave the classroom. So even just, just to pop in for 10 minutes, you will see the dynamics, the final one, and they can send you the articles, just the, all, just the, um, just the article uh, reference details of what they're doing so you can see they're on track for the previous lecture. Uh, but they own what they bring. They own what they bring. Uh, and then forward a little bit more. Uh, Matteo says, this is what our students are telling us. I don't think we have time for this, but these are BAME students in his exam, this very shy BAME student. I felt not as one person, but I felt as a person within an entity. And the entity was my group. Finally, shared identity, not every man for himself. So we go into a... Uh, uh, we, by the control of computer science students, and here we can say the mean, the mean for academic performance is, for the BME students, is much lower than for the white students. We give them one hour's training in these compassion skills. At the end of the module, we come back and see what's happened to the, how do they work in their group work? How do they get on? 228 students. A professor of statistics looks at this for every test he possibly can and says there is no BME gap here, not in, not in evidence for this group. So, uh, the results are sent to professor uh, to um, another reader in statistics at Edinburgh University, looking blind, the same results, the same results. Something is happening here and nobody could work out, nobody could work with students about how to bring each other in, really listen to each other and take care of each other than you. Nobody could do it better than you. So I'm just going to, going to finish now with this. Um, in other universities, uh, in, here, the, in midwifery, the feedback from the session was absolutely phenomenal. I had 30 emails from 65 students, all sitting in their different ethnic groups, about how much it had affected them, how they had taken each other to coffee immediately afterwards. Business school in Aberdeen University, I showed my business postgraduate students in Gata, as well as in Aberdeen, they were so grateful I could have cried, especially the women, women in Gata University who were not used to working with men, but were required to on the MBA, which, which Norton went to teach. He taught them the compassion skills. The women came back to him and said, this, we were making decisions with the men. Those compassion skills helped us so much. And the men understood them too. Uh, so I'm asking you, please join us. Here is the, here is the compassion in HE WordPress. We're working on virtual reality now with a brilliant PhD student uh, at the University of Hertfordshire. But this is us, guys. This is us. We, we are the system. That's why we can change the system. We can get these skills uh, on, on um, let me think. I want to show you one last thing. And all we ask students to do at the very, very beginning of the module, if you can't, you can even, Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry, Kate. I do apologize. I just want you to have a look at this, guys. This is the last thing I'd like you to look at. And this is one way of assessing students to give them that hour and then support them through, support them through um, the module. And then this could even be an assessment if you don't want to do it another way. Ask them to, to um, answer these questions. And what we got from those computer science students the 228 was so moving, I can't, and so moving, I can't tell you, and we haven't time. But just have a look at these, would you? Thank you so much. And that was just a page of work that if these divide into four questions, what I do to enhance my social, the social experience of my fellow students that they most value in me, students thought very, very deeply. And it was some very rich data indeed. We did not find any dis um, disconfirming voices there. The shy students who have hated it have come back and said, it's changed everything for me. I'm glad I pursued this. I'm glad I kept going. My friends helped me. Who are my friends? People I've never spoken to before. Come to the tutorial, never spoken to him. Two semesters, never spoken to him. They helped me. Everybody is taking care of each other. And this, I think, needs to be on the modern university degree program. We've got the theoretical base. We know compassion is a cognitive skill. It belongs everywhere. Thank you so much, Kate. I do apologize. I think I've gone way over. Uh, let me finish now, please. Thank you so much. You're fine, Theo. Thank Sorry you so much for that wonderful presentation. And it really wasn't going over time at all because there was no such thing. <laughs>
Okay, so um, we'll have five minutes for question and answer, everybody. So if you have any questions for Thea, do please pop them in the box, as usual. I can see a lot of thank yous going in. <laughs> But we'll take one or two questions and then we'll move on to the last presentation for the day. And if you can't think of a question right now, do hold on to it because there'll hopefully have be time for another short question and answer session at the end. Now, we're still seeing lots of thank yous and thought provokings and fantastics. And oh, we've got a question from Kathy Level. Have the careers team utilised this approach in your university? Yeah. Yes, indeed. A group of students were sent to, BM, uh, to BMI, uh, to an assessment centre in London, business students, and they came back very excited to say that those of them, that, that they had all used this and they'd been approached by the company afterwards to say, we do hope you will, you will apply for this company when you've graduated. What you were doing in group work there, we were very impressed with. So they were full of that when they came back. Um, it's uh, the our well-being team is also thinking about using the speed meeting in halls of residence. Of course, COVID has overcome that, but they've you know and self-compassion workshops are now run by our counselling team. The counselling team there got uh, the Compassionate Mind Foundation to come in and, and train them on how to deal with students' deep distress, bullying voices. So we and we're working together at Hertfordshire with our well-being team. Uh, we have a fantastic student union president now who's determined because he was a student of this. So now he's determined to help the university roll this out. And if you join the the website, it's all free. Remember that uh, you are now joining staff from 60 universities who are on this trail to get compassion onto the curriculum. It's a cognitive skill. It's been so misunderstood, the theoretical basis there. There is some kind of collective consciousness now, which has been stimulated by COVID stimulated by George Floyd's sacrifice. There is something happening now. And if it's if we can change it now, this is our moment. If we work together as a team, we can do it. We can do it. We can make big changes. I think that's a wonderful point to finish off on. I've just seen there's another question coming from Sebastian Bartkov who says, uh, thank you for supporting uh oh sorry, it just flipped off the screen. Thank you for supporting with evidence of something you identified. Can we hear a bit more about the evidence for the solutions you propose? Thank you for the interesting idea. Ah, at the end, at the I could just show you. Yes, of course, Sebastian, by all means. The Compassionate Mind Foundation, if you look in there, has run, I mean, my brother alone has published around 200 studies and books and chapters. Um, here's the evidence. I, I wasn't able to show you too much of this because we didn't have time, but there's evidence here, just a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of what staff have said in different universities when they've tried this out. But of course, also, um, at the end, there's some reading. So, so sorry, sorry, Kate. There's reading to do here, if you're interested. Um, the neuroscience of effective group work, there was an article there, assess compassion, that, that will explain more indeed what the stats were, were going on there. There's, a, there's all sorts of stuff going on here. And anybody who wanted to email me or, or have a chat, I'd be absolutely thrilled and delighted and perhaps to link you up with staff and other universities if Thanks, you wanted yeah. that. And then I think we'll have one quick... Oh, yes, I think it did. And also I know from experience there's a load more stuff on the website as well. So uh, we'll share the slides and that has a link to the website. We'll have a quick final question from Raj Samra. Um, she says, have you ever used it with academic staff to be more compassionate with each other? I've been, when I've gone to deans and said, look, shall we do this? Shall we try this with your students? There's been a long silence in the room with the with a couple of associate deans, and they've said, "Can you try the staff room first? Can you tap it how?" And it's simply because, my lovely friends, our brains are designed for us to be very, very sensitive to threats. So there are monopolizers and non-contributors in every staff room. Yes, the answer is yes, yes, yes. And if I may, I may say so, from from outside universities too, from the public sector. Could you please come in and help us put together? We have to put the, together the, 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 the committees that are influencing national guidelines, for example, for the police. We have monopolizers. We have um, police officers who don't speak because they're too junior. What do, come, and, come and do a workshop. This is for everybody. It's for all of us. And we are all really good at doing this. There's no doubt about this. 
our mammalian brain, when it links up to the neocortex, the yellow part of the brain, absolutely smashes it for much smarter critical thinking in groups than you could have imagined. If we can just dismantle this competitive individualistic stuff. Yes, it's for everywhere. It's for the workplace, it's for everywhere. But it must be in compassion. It was highly educated people who, um, it was highly educated people who instigated, who established and sustained the slave trade. It was highly, highly uh, educated people who brought about the 2008 crisis, the financial crisis, which is still presides over huge swathes of, um, of, of, of poverty around the world. They knew exactly what they were doing. And as, as Martin Luther King says, what is education without moral education? It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Now, my friends, now, my friends, we can put it right. We've got the theory, we've got the evidence, the Compassionate Mind Foundation is prolific at really, really good, robust studies and at drawing them around. Stanford University, another center of excellence there on the nature of compassion. There's no, there's no reason for us to be shy now about going forward with this. Very, very confidently Thank indeed. Thank you so much, Theo. I just wanted to finish by echoing that call that you said about, about five minutes ago that just absolutely gave me goosebumps. We are the system, and that's why we can change the system. So with that in mind, I say thank you so much for that really interesting exactly. talk. Us. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Kate. Okay, Kate. so thank I think you, we'll Nina. move on quickly thank now, you. and I will switch my camera on. Okay, with a bit of luck, you can all see me now. And then we'll move into the final presentation of the day, which is mine. Um, and I'm going to try to be really fast because <laughs> we are going to be a little bit short on time. No, you're fine. It was a pleasure. Don't worry. And honestly, it's far more important for people to hear you than to hear me right now. They can hear me anytime, so I'm internal. Okay. So the last talk of the day then is mine, and it's around the work that we've that I've been doing in the OU and towards embedding mental well-being in the curriculum. And it is very, very much echoing the wonderful words of. Elena and Theo as well. So this is why I kind of put everybody together, although I'll admit that they are a tough act to follow in the last talk of the day. So normally I start the talk by giving a little bit of an overview of the kind of the noise that's going on around mental health and student mental health being in the sector at the moment. I think I'll skip past this um, because I think we all know that mental health has been shown to affect student progression, completion, attainment and employment. So I'll skip past the slide, but you will be able to see it and ch uh, check these resources later if you want. I think we can just take that as well and move on. I think we also all know that student mental health disclosures are growing fairly rapidly. And just in the OU context, for example, we know that this time last year we had 16,844 students disclosing mental health conditions to us, compared with only 9,383 in October 2016, so uh, four years uh, previously. So we are seeing a large increase of students disclosing mental health issues, and yet we are not seeing any change in the gap that, student, that, that we're seeing, that we're having to report for our access and participation plan in terms of module completion. So this, this slide just gives a little overview of the gaps that we've been reporting, and you can see that the ones for mental health are hovering at around about 16 percentage points. Um, so what can we do about this? And there's quite a lot of things that we can do and in different levels. So we know that we need to support students with their mental health needs in a timely way. That's kind of fairly basic. We know that we need to be proactive in promoting mental well-being and anticipating mental health triggers or issues. And then when we're moving on to the slightly more complex side of things, we know that we can empower students to build skills and strategies to overcome adversity, build resilience, manage their well-being, and celebrate their achievements. Oh, I've got a bit of it. Going on. Some people have got their mic on. Oh, no worries. Okay, it seems to have gone. Good. So, moving. On. So these these things tend to focus more on the student, but I think also, particularly in the OU, we need. And also, actually, this echoes very much what Sophia and Elena have said. We need to accept that HE needs to change, and we need to work to understand how it can change by learning about diverse student experiences and their journeys. And then we need to adapt our tuition, our curriculum, and our learning environment so that they're inclusive and so that they engender student well-being. So this then leads me into the project that I've been working on for the last couple of years around the research questions about identifying barriers and enablers to mental well-being that students experience, identifying staff-created solutions or student and staff collaborative solutions to reduce these barriers, 
looking at how these solutions can be embedded in practice, and then looking at how staff and students perceive these interventions can be evaluated. Um, the project has taken place over four stages. The first stage was interviews, in which 16 students and five tutors told their stories. Students told their own stories, and the tutors told stories told stories of the students that they've supported over the years, particularly focusing on the barriers and the enablers of mental well-being. And I turned these into vignettes to replace, uh, sorry, to represent diverse journeys and issues, and I'll share a bit more about that later. The next stage was focus groups, and I think some of you in the room have attended those, where you were some of the wonderful 116 staff and students who attended three focus groups and analysed vignettes and identified barriers. I'll talk about that a bit more later on. Stage three was pilot projects where we start, where we took the solutions that we created in stage two and tried them out, and that's where we are now. And stage four is a survey, which is going to be taking place next month. So, of the sixteen student stories and five star um, five stories from ALs um, talking about different student stories, this gave me an awful lot of data, as you can imagine. I've got something like nineteen and a half hours worth of interview data that got transcribed and popped into Vivo and analysed according to the following model. So we looked at barriers and enablers and uh, changed the, um, sorry, did those as uh, study related barriers. Oh, I've got an echo again. Has somebody got their mic on? Yeah, okay, I think it might be you. Can you just pop yourself on mute? Fab. Okay, I think that's gone. Thank you. So yeah, identifying barriers and enablers that related to study, that related to skills, and that related to the study environment. And these got turned into a rather beautiful taxonomy that you probably can't see, because I can barely see it. Ah, oh, this normally works when I do it in Teams. OK, it's the joy of the text. But you can have a look at this on the website. And I'll share the link to that a little bit later. Oh, you can see it, Gareth. OK, that's good, because I can barely see it. It must be because I'm on the small screen. But I'll talk you through it, because I know it really well, because I created it anyway. Um, so, the main point of this was that both barriers and enablers to mental well-being are represented throughout the entire student experience. So, throughout the environment that they're in, throughout the skills that they develop or have to develop or don't develop, and throughout the study environment, uh, through their studies. So, relating to the curriculum and in the activities, group work was the one that came up most, so echoing what Theo was saying, uh, relating to the content of the curriculum and the, and the way it was designed. Uh, relating to tuition, tutorials, their relationship with their tutor and the support they receive, relating to the assessment, uh, both in the assessment design, the way that it's delivered, the type of assessment. And then this overlaps and goes on to the next section, which is around skills development. And there were barriers there, both in their study skills, in their self-management skills, and in their social skills, which include um, communication skills, and also in the study environment, so including spaces, distance spaces, physical spaces, social media spaces, uh, the people that they engage with, the systems, the practices, the policies, the rules that they have to engage with, and their general life. Barriers and enablers were inherent throughout all of these. And so I created this as a taxonomy so that you can map the barriers with the corresponding enablers on the other side of the wheel. However, and I'm, I was very excited when I created this, it was like, oh, it all comes together. Oh, so at the same time, oh, it's just got bigger. Thank you, Christina. I'm assuming that was you. I can see it now. I wasn't doing it all from memory anymore. <laughs> so I've completely lost my train of thought now that I can actually see it. Um, so, oh, yes, that's right. I was very excited when I created this because, as I said, you can map the, the barriers to the enablers on the other side of the wheel. But I've discovered that the second stage of this, which I'll talk more about in a moment, that an enabler is not the same as a solution. And sometimes something entirely different is involved in order to turn a barrier into an enabler. So I'll whiz on and won't go any more into detail about that, but you can access that on the website, which I'll share the link to at the end of the slide. So the next stage was turning these student journeys into vignettes in a way that the 116 focus group participants could use to identify what they thought the barriers and the enablers were. Um, as many of you will know, Tim and I have done quite a lot of work around uh, vignettes and student journey representations. And this just gives you an, a quick example of some of the other ones which are out there, which are all maybe not flawed, maybe that's harsh, but they're either overly simplistic or overly complicated or overly text heavy, and that makes them difficult to analyze. So using the Our Journey tool that Tim and I have been working on, I created some rather beautiful vignettes that represent student mental health that we used in the focus groups. 
And again, you can see these on the website well, with our team. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the focus groups where we talk, where we identified these. So the focus groups, we held three events in the end. There were supposed to be five, but between strikes and COVID, it went down to three. Still had 116 people, so I'm not complaining about that. Um, we had nine students and 107 staff from extremely diverse roles across the university. That's one of the things I'm most proud of about this project is how it's I've really struggled, or not struggled, really tried to make sure that um, diverse voice was represented throughout from diverse stakeholders. Um, and we captured group data, individual data, and group interaction data from these um, from these events to identify what the barriers were and the enablers were, what staff and students uh, perceived they were, and also their ideas for solutions. Um, long story short with this slide was that the staff and students identified very much the same enablers and barriers as me, so hooray. Um, and they also revealed reference 91 references to solutions, which were turned into 16 project ideas, six of which related to environmental barriers, five to skills related barriers, and five to study related barriers. Of those 16 projects, seven are going ahead. Uh, another two of them are also going ahead, but unrelated to this project. They're going ahead in a completely different guise, but still they are going ahead. So seven projects are currently in progress in some level or another. There's one around staff training, which is a micro-credential on embedding mental wellbeing in the curriculum. There's one around learning design, uh, which is a model for embedding mental wellbeing in module production. Student resources is the My Wellbeing discipline-specific wellbeing guidance pages, which will be appearing on subject sites from January onwards. Uh, tutorials, uh, there's a self-assessment tool for tutors to, order, to help them audit the level of wellbeing in the tutorial material. Uh, student study support, so, um, one of the projects going ahead is around emotional resilience guides for students when they're studying a distressing topic. Uh, university systems, there's a box going out for DSA needs assessors to better support OU students uh, as part of the, sorry, DSA is Disabled Students Allowance, just for anybody who wasn't sure about that, um, is part of the university systems that are extremely stressful for students, particularly those with mental health issues. So we identified that there was a need to do something in that area. And then finally, there's one around transitions, which the careers team are working on, which would be a wellbeing strategy with corresponding events and resources and things like that. So all of these projects are at different stages due to COVID-19, but the plan is that they'll all be in place in one way or another by January 2021. So I've got a load of resources here to share with you. There's the project website, which gives all the details, gives you the taxonomy and the um, vignettes and everything like that, and a few other bits and pieces as well. There's some other links. You can have a link to the Our Journey tool if you want to create your own student vignette. Um, there's a few other bits and pieces here as well, and some sector wide things. So that's everything from me. Um, and if you have any questions, do feel free to pop them in the chat. Or if you have any questions for the other speakers as well, for Thea or Elena, if they're still here, uh, that you've only just thought of now, do feel free to pop those in the chat as well. And we'll just spend the last sort of 10 minutes having a kind of more general conversation. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, I can see multiple people are typing. Great. Okay, lots of thank yous. You're very welcome. Thank you for listening. Um, but any questions, anybody? <laughs> okay, Lois has raised her hand. Uh, would you like to speak, Lois? Do you want to put your mic? Oh, I didn't mean to actually put my hand up, but I was just about to type a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, hang on. I've taken my headphones out, so I can't hear you. <laughs> can you hear me? We can hear you, Lois. Oh, yeah, oh, I can hear you, Lois. The stupid thing was I took my earphones out, so then I couldn't hear you. Um, I didn't mean to put my um, hand up, but actually I was typing a question. Um, I, I was uh, um, One of the problems that, that I've really noticed in the last few months with, with our medical students is that loneliness and isolation um, is a, a new problem. They're, they're, they're usually very well socialised as a group, um, and because of COVID, this isn't happening and everything um, that can be moved online is being moved online and I'm sure it's the same for, for many other um, um, groups of students as well but it's a new thing for me to, to deal with and I wondered if anybody has got any practical solutions for how to connect people um, 
uh, within online learning or even beyond the learning environment. This, this loneliness is, is a real problem. Yeah, that was one of the things that came up very much in my study. In fact, if I can flick back to the taxonomy, it is there. If I can go back that far and I can show you what the corresponding enabler was. Well, I can spoiler alert by the time I've got to it. It's community. So isolation was a key. Isolation in terms of spaces came up as a, as a barrier time and time and time again. However, the distance learning environment is not synonymous with isolation and lots of students managed to find successful communities that supported their well-being. The tricky thing is that those communities can look very different for different students and so finding the right mix is it's a challenge I think and it's something that students can be supported to do for themselves. Lots of students talked about the power of social media and their peer support and the peer communities that they build. However, many of them didn't discover this until much later on in their studies. Until they're sort of, I mean, with the OU, they studied for six or seven years and they didn't discover it until the third or fourth year. One of the key things around community that students talked about was uh, flexibility and multiple channels. So for people having the option of social media, but having other options as well. Some people find WhatsApp groups helped. Some people find community within modules, within forums, but they, they were few and far between, to be fair. I think for the most part, the more official spaces and the university-led spaces were less conducive to community in the OU environment. Um, but that may vary in different places. There was also a lot of talk around the small things, going back to what Elena said in the beginning, the small things making a difference, um, the small aspects of community, people sharing little for, for example, from the OU, people sharing their pictures of their stationery, their desk setup, their unboxing of their module materials, their boxes and things like this, the boxes of their books, sorry, and bits and pieces could make them feel that they're part of something. Because an awful lot of the isolation side of things leads is it's linked with this sense of identity. This, what am I doing? How am I, you know, am I am I measuring up? I can't see the people around me. I don't know how I fit into this community. And so seeing people representing their community, their, their um, experience of study was something that people found really helpful. I don't know if that's helped at all, Lois, or if I've just burbled on, but if anyone else has anything to jump to say, do jump in. Okay, so I've got a question from Sebastian Barco. Um, I'm on a production team at a very early stage. What's something we should plan for from day one? Oh, interesting. Okay, tell me more. What discipline for a start? And what level? Psychology MSc. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, in my experience, a lot of students study psychology because they want to understand themselves um, and they want to understand and they want in many cases, and this is the students with the mental health issues that I spoke to, and a lot of times uh, they want to study psychology so that they can bring their own lived experience to it and so that they can help use the kind of the models and the understanding to make sense and of, of their own situations. And many times they were able to do this further down the line again. The things that the students found most helpful in many cases was the theory, but it was always about applying it to real people. So they talked about um, some of the psychology courses have personas and vignettes and things like this, and they really apply these theories to practice. Um, the things that students found most challenging about psychology, in my experience, was the maths and stats. And so um, I would say getting something in around maths anxiety very early on and supporting them to build those skills and that side of things could help with um, the sense of identity again and the sense of am I doing well enough, am I being, am I good enough for this? Because a lot of students felt quite ambushed by the maths and stats. But yeah, something, uh, oh yeah, okay, so Claire said that M3, M303 have done some good work on building resilience around maths, fantastic, thank you. Um, the other thing is that we're, as part of the My Wellbeing pages, uh, there'll be scopes to share things there as well. Uh, the other side of things I'd say is helping students develop those positive habits for planning their studies, develop having a study session and things like this. There are some wonderful worksheets that an OU student, OU business student created and shared on Instagram. Uh, her name's Chloe Burrows and one student in particular said they absolutely helped her so much. And it's around 
there's these little worksheets and you have one for every time you're going to do a study session. You say how long you're going to study, what you're going to focus on and what you're going to procrastinate. So there's a little celebration of procrastination there. Um, there's a little section on hydration. It sounds really silly. It's got little water drops and every time you drink a glass of water, you have to colour it in. So it's getting these positive habits in and really embedding those in study. If you can get those in early on, that can really help a student later on. Okay, do I have a link to the worksheet? I've got one somewhere, but if you just Google them, her name's Chloe Burrows, um, or I can share one afterwards. Um, she's, they've started out on Instagram, but you can get them on Facebook and she's got a website and things now, I think. Um, I can look out a link for those there, Chandra, as well. But yeah, if you Google them, Chloe Burrows worksheet. Okay, any other questions? We've got about four minutes. So I can, oh, you found her, brilliant, Olivia. Uh, if anyone else has got one quick question, and if not, we will move on. Oh, okay. Yeah, Christina, thank you very much. Christina's just put on the discussion questions. And the plan was we were going to have a discussion at the end, but we haven't got time for that. So um, actually, that's a really good point, Christina. Thank you. I'll leave you with that as, as the goodbye. That's a really good idea. So we were going to discuss what ideas or implications for your individual practice this session has suggested. What ideas has it inspired for research or scholarship activity in your areas? And what are your key takeaways from today? So I'll leave you with those. Uh, thoughts to think about in your own time. In the meantime, I know that Elena and Theo are really happy to take any questions by email if you have any, uh, or email me and I'll connect you. And thank you so much, Elena and Theo, for your amazing presentations. Thank you so much, Christina, for being the incredible person that you are and managing everything so seamlessly, because it would be a shambles if it, would left, if it was left up to me. And thank you so much for all our participants for attending and for being so generous with your comments and, and your questions. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a lovely afternoon, what's left of it. And I'll speak to you all soon, I'm sure.